Well, I'm excited, and I think the fans can be excited for the same reasons, just the, the way this team has adapted to change, um, the way they've, they've embraced it, and the way they've worked and put their head down and uh, really have been focused on, on what the goal is, and that's to win a championship. Coach Walters, thank you so much for joining us on This Is Purdue. I know our listeners are so excited to learn more about you and this new era of Purdue football, right? So let's kick it off, get to know you a little bit. What was your childhood like growing up in Colorado? Um, it, was, it, was a, uh, it was a fun one. You know, I, um, my parents are young. They had me, you know, when they were 16. So I feel like we grew up together. Um, I had a, my brother uh, right around when they were 21. So I was like five and a half. Um, you know, dad played football, so I grew up in a locker room. Um, he had a, a bunch of injuries. I think he had like three ACLs coming out of college. So he ended up going to law school afterwards. So we spent some more time in Boulder, quiet, you know, community, um, lived in family housing, which was, you know, our apartment was right across the street from the practice fields. So it just felt like I was always around football. Um, uh, took a liking to it at a young age. And, you know, my parents sort of fed that for me and was always, you know, playing baseball, basketball, football growing up, just whatever season the sport was in, that was what I was interested in. Um, and then, you know, I went to high school in Aurora, Colorado, uh, Grandview High School, um, played quarterback my whole life, didn't, didn't really, you know, play a down a defense until I got to college, so that was interesting. Um, but it was, it was good, you know, I had a, a good support system, um, you know, was a, a part of really good communities that, that helped, you know, cultivate the things that I was good at and, and, and tried to strengthen my weaknesses. And, you know, I think I'm where I am today as a result of my past. Was there ever a day you were like, I'm, I'm not going to go the football route or was it always ingrained in you? Um, there was, there was one day, um, at the university of Arizona, I was GA there and I was, came down to like the final two for getting the full-time secondary job. And Dwayne Aquina was the secondary coach at Texas at the time. Um, was alumni at uh, U of A. And, you know, Mike Stoops was the head coach at, at the time. He told me, you know, if, if we're gonna offer the job to Dwayne, if he takes it, he's obviously he got, he's got it. But if he doesn't, um, you got the job. And so I'm thinking there's no way, you know, Coach Aquina's gonna leave Texas to go to Arizona. Um, he ultimately did. And so that day I was like, you know what, I'm done. <laughs> Um, those are when you, when you had, you know, one GA per side of the ball. Uh, we had a, a, a QC, but he was a special team. So I was doing everything. This was before PFF and and all of those things. We didn't have any student assistance. So um, I was inputting all the data and, and doing all the all the, the dirty work. Um, but, you know, I obviously loved the game, loved uh, the people I was working for. Uh, stuck it out, and I think it was like three weeks later, Kenny went back to Texas, so I got my first full-time job. So glad I glad I uh, stuck through that, you know, 24 hours worth of, of temper tantrum. Sure. Well, you know, I've read you faced a lot of adversity, you know, with your health growing up and mm -hmm. in high school and college, uh, like personal things that you and your wife have gone through. How did you keep going and keep keep up with that persistence? Yeah, I think, you know, like I said, growing up in a household with – a solid structure definitely helped. Um, you know, I got to see a firsthand experience with my dad, um, you know, inner city LA, pregnant with my mom at 16, you know, injuries in, in college, and but he was just, there was never an excuse. I never heard him complaining about anything. Um, and so having that example in the home really helped just how to deal with that adversity, you know, how to lean on people around you when, when it gets tough. I mean, really realizing that the sun is going to rise and set no matter what is what is going on in your personal world, and and the world doesn't really care. You know, it's it. You know, people are still going to have good days. People are still going to have bad days. And it's just kind of what you do with your 24 hours, um, and and who you surround yourself with that can kind of pull you through those adverse moments. Tell us a little bit about your family and how how they've been adapting to West Lafayette and this Boilermaker community. Yeah, they love it so far. Um, you know, I got two boys, Aaron and Kaysen, who are nine and seven. Um, they, you know, they're inundated in sports and everything, you know, athletic and, uh, but are still very well versed. My wife does a really good job of getting them involved in everything under the sun. So 
Um, but they moved out here after spring break and have d dove into Little League baseball and um, developing friends and, and making this a community. And they really have had felt the support from the community. So it's been a, an easy transition. That's great to hear. Tell us a little bit about your journey to Purdue. What made you want to go for this coveted head coach role? Yeah, um, you know, one, we, we played against Purdue the last two years I was at Illinois and, and didn't come out on the uh, the victors <laughs> column. So um, th this was one of the schools, you know, as a defensive coordinator was the most difficult to prepare for. Um, and so I knew the, obviously knew the lay of the land from a conference standpoint and this side of the Big Ten. Um, but other than that, I didn't know a whole lot about Purdue. I, I knew that Drew Brees played here a long time ago, right? Being a quarterback guy and, and a fan of, of that position. I knew it was a great academic school. Um, but other than that, I, I didn't know a whole lot. Um, and so going through the interview process, you know, when, when I saw Louisville opened up, I thought there was a high probability that, that Coach Brown would go back just because of the, the last time that that job was vacant and his history there is him and his family's history there. And I remember calling my agent saying, hey, if, if Brom leaves, like that, I'd be definitely interested in that job. And he's like, you know, we're already on it. Um, so I had an initial phone call with, um, with Mike and Tiffany, and that just felt easy. It felt fluid. Um, so that really sparked my interest even more in the job. And then um, sitting down in our last in-person interview, just the idea of what, what it takes to be successful at this level um, the idea of what type of resources are required to be successful on a consistent basis at this level. Um, their, their vision for that was in alignment with mine. And that I think is rare in today's college athletics and the landscape of, of college football specifically, where you've got alignment from the president to the administration, to the athletic department, to football. You know, it's, it's hard enough to win games on Saturday. So if, if those things aren't aligned, it makes it even more difficult. And so I remember walking out of that, that interview and calling my wife and saying, I really want this job because I want to work with those people. And, you know, maybe 18 hours later, I, I get a phone call and get, get the job offer, accepted it. And then, you know, I'm coming down from Cherry Lane and you see the facilities, you know, you see the, uh, the community and, and how, how inundated the fan base is with, with the athletics here. You know the proximity to Indy and Chicago and St. Louis, and you got a you know a major airport that's an hour away. And I feel like I was a 16 year old got a keys to a Lamborghini. So <laughs> you know, I'm hoping to be here for a long time. Coach Gerald's talked about you know coming out of that that locker room and Mackie walking down that hallway with that same kind of vision yeah. that you had coming down Cherry Lane. Um, so take us back to that phone call when you got it. What what was going through your mind? One, it was you know I. When I got into the profession, I, I knew I wanted to be head coach um, at a young age, and so I knew in order to do that, I wanted you got to be a coordinator. You got to do very well as a, a coordinator to get a look to be a, to get interviews for jobs like this. And so, um, you know, I, when I got into the profession, I knew I wanted to be a, a coordinator by 35 and a head coach by 40. And so I, I remember getting that phone call and talking to Mike and. You know, when I hung up, I was just like, wow, this is, this is real. Like, it happened, and it happened a little bit earlier than I thought. And, and you know, it was, it was the same way as a defense coordinator, too. So I'm um, just keep, keeping the trend going right now. What do you think are the advantages of being one of the youngest head coaches in America? You know, I think the age in and of itself lends it to having organic relationships with the mm -hmm. players. It's just, you know, I speak the same language. We listen to the same music. Um, you know, I can still get in and down on a, on a video game, you know, from time to time. <laughs> um, and then also, too, it just, I think you have a better sense of kind of what's going on from a societal standpoint. Sure. Um, you know, there's, there are things that are distracting that weren't the case, you know, 10 years ago with social media and everybody's a critic and everybody has access um, to a, a wide network of, of people. And so I just think looking at it from a, a different lens and, and really keeping the focus on the players and what their experience is and, and having no egos in the building, um, I think is, it's easier to, to do that at 36, 37. So I definitely have used that to my advantage and also use it as a chip on my shoulder to continue to get better and evolve you know, year in and year out.
That leads to my next question. Are there any disadvantages? Were you ever doubted during some of your interview processes at other schools or other for other positions? Yeah, I mean, the question was always, you know, he, how, what makes you the right person for this job? Because you've had zero years of experience as a head right. coach. Um, but every first time head coach has had zero years of experience. Um, but I think with this, this landscape and the ever-changing um, world that is college football, you know, I felt like I was more ready than somebody that's been doing it for 20 years. You know, you look at it in terms of a, a corporation and all of a sudden somebody's been working, you know, 20 years at that same corporation policy changes. Well, it can be really hard for, you know, that employee to change. Um, sometimes they might even fight that change. Whereas you get that same company and somebody is employed right when that policy changes, you know, they, they thrive in it, they adapt to it and it's a easy transition. So, you know, with NIL and, and, and player empowerment and, uh, the transfer portal and all those things. I don't. I don't look at them as difficulties. I look at them as opportunities. And so I just think, you know, with with me coming on the front end of of this frontier, mm -hmm. I think it's it'll it'll be easier for myself and my staff to adapt to the changing landscape. Has it really hit you yet that you're in the ranks of you know the Jack Mollenkoffs and Joe Tillers as as a head coach at Purdue? It ha it has. Um, I was walking through the lobby with my two boys, you know, with the cradle of quarterbacks and the dinner defensive ends. And I don't know when they had changed it, but they, it also shows the head coaches. And then my name is there. And, <laughs> you know, my wife turns to me and she's like, no, you will ever for, you will forever be, you know, in stitch in the history of Purdue football. When she said that, I was like, wow, this is, it is real. Like seeing my name on the, on that wall and with the dash next to it. And, and now it's, you know, what do I do with that dash? Right. What can fans be excited about this coming season? What are you excited about? Probably aligns with the same thing. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited. And I think the fans can be excited for the same reasons. Just the, the way this team has adapted to change, um, the way they've, they've embraced it, and the way they've worked and put their head down and uh, really have been focused on, on what the goal is, and that's to win a championship. Um, but, you know, they, this university got close to it a year ago. And so it's not a rebuild. And obviously we've got a, a ton of new players and lost a whole bunch of productivity from a year ago. Um, but at the same time, you know, this isn't a, it isn't a rebuild. This is trying to elevate the standard and, and maintain that level of success. And so I think fans can be excited for the style of play um, for competitive, tough, disciplined football. What was that transition like going from a defensive coordinator at Illinois, you know, to this, this head coach role? Yeah, so the, I think the the thing that's been most difficult is just at practice. You know, I can't get too excited about one side of the ball, <laughs> um, you know, winning a play over, over the other and, and sort of that balance of uh, controlling emotions, right? You know, if, a, if Hudson throws a pass to Dion, you know, for a deep touchdown, like I'm happy as heck that we scored a touchdown because it was a great play, but I'm also upset because we allowed a touchdown on the other side of the ball. So just that balancing act and, and really getting involved in both sides of the ball has been um, not hard, but, but different for sure. Speaking of practices, I've heard your practices are laid out a little bit differently than, than the previous uh, football era here. So what's, what's that vibe like? Why is it important to you to you know, play the popular music, have that really disciplined schedule when it yeah. comes to practices? Well, we try to, we try to put as much stress and, and pressure on them as possible while still keeping it fun and engaging. Um, you know, it's, there's, there is no replacement for experience. Um, and so to, to try to, you know, fabricate the experience and, and put you in situations and scenarios um, that applies pressure and, and a lot makes you think on your feet and react, um, th those things are important just to, to be ready for a game day and game to like atmospheres. What, what was it like? Talk about the significance of getting Hudson Card in the portal. Yeah, it was, it was huge because we didn't have a quarterback with any experience on the roster. Um, and so, you know, I knew with, with Aiden leaving and obviously playing against Aiden the last two years, I knew what, what caliber of, of player he was and how important he was to not only this offense, but this team. Um, and so talking with, with Nate and just going through the roster when I first got here um, and seeing that void and, and like that position is the most important position in sports, period. Um, and, and if if 
what I was saying through the interview process was to win a championship, then I know I had to go get a high level quarterback in order to do so. And in my opinion, you know, Hudson was the best one in the portal. And so made that priority number one. Um, as soon as we hired a, Graham as a, I was the offensive coordinator, picked him up in Dallas and then went to go see Hudson and his family at Lake Travis. And, you know, it's, the history has been ever since. So just the great family, uh, Hudson's been doing a great job. Just I thought his approach to um, coming in here and, and taking the reins was was exactly what you needed. You know, he didn't, he didn't come in here and, and was pointing and, and holding people accountable off the off the jump. You know, he, he came in, put his head down, went to work and earned the respect of his, of his teammates and of everybody in the locker room. And, you know, I think his talent speaks for itself. And once guys sort of saw what he was capable of doing, they they really backed him 100%. Relationship building seems really important to you. Why why is that? You know, I think I think people forget we are like the service business, right? Like this, uh, like I've played my last down. I I will never put on cleats ever again. <laughs> um, people don't go into the into Rossi to to watch any of us coach. They come to watch the players play, and so I think. Um, you know, if your focus is on their experience, then your focus should also be on on your relationship. And so, I think you know we've done a, a good job as a staff of of putting people in place that care about this profession in that way. Um, and these relationships last a lifetime. You know, you, I hope one day that everybody in the locker room you know invites me to their wedding and and you know sends me uh, Christmas cards and stuff yeah. like that. You know what I mean? So. Um, especially with the transfer portal as well, I think you know your relationships are more important now than ever. When you're you know trying to recruit Hudson to come to Purdue, when you're trying to recruit all of these players, frankly, what what are the selling points? Why why do you, how do you sell Purdue? Why why do you think students want to come here? Well, I think the university sort of sells itself um, just from an academic standpoint, uh, from an aesthetic standpoint, um, and then you know we just try to show them who we are. And it's not fabricated, it's not rehearsed. Um, it's real and it's organic. And so I think we can, we offer a unique experience um, just in that sense where, where we try to make everybody feel comfortable in their own skin. Um, we're still giving them parameters and, and guidelines on, on how to improve. Um, but I definitely think it's important when you walk out of this building with your eligibility exhausted and your, and your diploma in hand that you are confident and comfortable in your own skin uh, when you enter the real world. Tell us a little bit about this schedule. It's pretty pretty daunting, pretty challenging. How do you feel um, going into the season? Do you have any specific games you're really looking forward to or maybe even worried about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, never worried. Okay. You know, the um, the confidence is in the preparation and, and I promise you we'll be over over prepared. Uh, but, you know, I'm looking forward to Fresno State. Like that's, that's the first game. Um, it's the first time We'll walk out of the tunnel um, as, a, as a new team um, and get to introduce ourselves to college football this season. Um, as far as like the the dauntingness of this of the schedule, I mean it's the Big Ten. That's that's what you signed up for. Um, I think it's exciting to, to have Ohio State and Michigan. You know those are the those are the two top dogs in this conference, um, and and so you get to to size yourself up twice in the in the same season. Um, it'll be difficult, of course. It's, in the, it's the Big Ten, like I said, but, but I'm excited and, and so are our guys. So September 2nd, when you're getting ready to walk through that tunnel, what do you think you'll be feeling? I don't know. I, I mean, excitement, obviously. obviously um, I'm sure there'll be a, a litany of, of emotions. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to see these guys play. Like, they put in a lot of work, and Coach Rowe and his, and his staff has done an awesome job with them through eight weeks in the in the winter and then now eight weeks in the summertime to get them prepared to go play football. And so I just, I'm excited to see what the what the product is and, and see how guys react to adverse situations and how they feed off each other and, and you know, how they handle things when, when things aren't going their way. What excites you about, about this group of players? Like what kind of team building things have happened over the summer or what kind of what can fans expect from this, yeah. this team? What, what, uh, these guys, like, they love football. And so that's one thing about this program. Like, if you love ball, you're going to have a great time here and you'll thrive. If you don't, it's going to be really, really hard for you. Um, so everybody we got in the locker room, I think they, they enjoy the game for the right reasons. Like, it's not for Twitter followers and Instagram likes. They love ball for ball. And that's um, evident by 
the amount of time they spend in this building, um, how much they hang out with each other, um, how much they they enjoy doing extra. Um, and so I'm excited to see to see that and how it, how that looks in terms of productivity, you know, on Saturdays. I love that. Do you and your team of coaches, you know, how would you say that you mentor the players off the field? Because that's a huge component too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you know, just like you talked about earlier with the relationship building, um, you know, I've been a part of staffs where, you know, the head coach like mandates, okay, you know, twice this month, I want you guys to have your players over for dinner, you know, things like that, take them to get a meal. Um, so when I got the job, I didn't want to do that because I just wanted to see you know, how, how our staff would interact. I, I know most of these guys, I've worked closely with most of them. Um, the guys that I didn't know came highly recommended from people I really trust. And so um, I wanted to just see sort of how they interacted with the, with the guys in the locker room. And to a man, like they've had multiple dinners and multiple meals and seen movies and all kind of stuff. Um, so un, undirected, you know, from, from me, so. That's been encouraging, and um, you know, like I said, relationships are are, pre are at a premium here at uh, Purdue. Do you and your family have any favorite spots yet on campus um, that you would like to visit, like to go to? Tell us about that. Yeah, so I, you know, I lived at the Union basically for <laughs> like eighty-seven nights. Um, oh my goodness! And so that you know, the restaurant and bar area there, um, you know, the food is great, the the service is unbelievable. Um, we like eating at East End and at uh, Ripple. Those are good spots. Uh, Yadagarasu is, is a, my favorite ramen place. Uh, basil Thai, I'm a big uh, ethnic food, you know, love Thai food. Basil Thai is, is good right here on campus. And um, the, the folks over at TAP do a great job for us as well. You've certainly been persistent, you know, in your football journey, your career. What does that word persistence mean to you? Uh, to me, it's it's... Really, it's like it's how you should be if you if you got a goal in mind, like don't don't stop, you know, don't don't sell yourself short. Um, don't uh, be discouraged when it doesn't happen right now. Um, so persistence is just c continually trying to improve in order to, to reach whatever that goal is that that you're trying to improve for. You've highlighted this a lot throughout the whole interview, but what does this Boilermaker community mean to you and your family right now? It's been everything. Like this this transition, you know, anytime you move as a family, it's difficult. Um, and so in this profession, you tend to move a lot. Um, so that can be, it can be hard on familial relationships. And so it would have been even more difficult if we moved here and weren't welcomed. Um, and so to see the excitement, um, the, to see the genuine, um, I don't know, like it feels like they care about me and my family, you know, um, they want to see us do well. And so um, that, that just adds incentive, you know, from, from me in this chair to make sure I'm doing a good job and, and, and make sure this, this program is headed in the right direction um, because of the kind of uh, warm embrace that the community has, has given uh, my family and I. What do you think the fans will be like September 2nd at Ross Aid. Well, I'm just glad I'm, I'm on the home side of it now. <laughs> um, I remember in 21, I think it was like an 11 a.m. kickoff, and we came out for warm-ups, and the place was going crazy, and I'm like, what is going on, you know? <laughs> we were, I was an hour and a half down the street, and we couldn't get anybody to the game. <laughs> but uh, so excited to be on the home side of that, and I'm um, looking forward to the season. What would you say your next giant leap is? Do you have one? My, from a personal standpoint, it's we're building a house right now, and so that uh, I'm excited about that. Um, but from a career standpoint, like I want to be here. This is I, f I feel like the grass is not always greener, right? It's to me it gets green when you fertilize it and then water it, and so I'm I'm pouring into this job and pouring into this place and pouring into this community. Um, you know, I got like I said, my my two boys are nine and seven, and I hope they say they're from West Lafayette when I grow up. And so if they if that holds true, then that means that I, I will have done what I thought I could do here and we'll have built something here that um, is, is longstanding and hopefully I can retire and people will talk about the Walters area the same way they do the Tiller. I love that. I think our football fans will love hearing that too. Is there anything else I missed? Is there anything you want to share with our listeners? No, just we're excited and, and the guys have been working. Um, you know, I, 
just like I just got back from vacation and couldn't wait to get back just to be around the, the people inside this building and um, you know I missed I missed West Lafayette and, and so I'm, I'm excited to be here. That's awesome. Well, we can't thank you enough for your time. Thank you so much, Coach. Thank you.